Nagyon-nagyon sok szeretettel köszöntöm itt Martin, aki eljött hozzánk Amerikából, de még mielőtt neki odaadnám a mikrofont, odaadom kívánok a mikrofont, és te megszerintek mondani Just, just very briefly, uh, thank you very much, Raj, for coming, and thank you very much also for you to, to be here, to be there. Uh, I think that the lifelong learning process is still living, so I'm here as a student. Otherwise, I'm part of the film department. Some of us are from the film department of Delta, and we we are also part of the lifelong learning. So, thank you and. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you to the film fund and the university for inviting me, and I'm very flattered that so many people were interested in coming to this. So um, I apologize that you have to sit for so long in such hard seats. I empathize with you very much, but hopefully it will be worth it. So, okay. Um, just. I don't know how much you know was in the bio about myself, but I'll just to say a few words about myself, what what I do, and you know where I came from. So I'm from next door. I'm from Prague. I was born there in uh, 1961, and my father was a film educator and a film producer and a screenwriter, and he was the dean of the uh, Czech Film Academy during the time of the Czech New Wave. And at that time, uh, some people came from America because they saw the school was successful and they wanted to know what the secret was. And so, you know, they, they actually asked him to come to America and tour all the film schools in America and make a report on American film education. And he did, you know, and he found some, some problems. And eventually, it was very lucky that he made that connection because, as you know, in 1968, the Soviet tanks came. And so that gave him a place to go, and my whole family a place to go. And so we moved to America. And there he became the dean of the American Film Institute and was the teacher of people like the man whose film we're going to look at, David Lynch. So if you read David Lynch's book, he says, I learned everything about script writing from Frank Daniel. Okay, And um, people like Paul Schrader and Terrence Malick and a whole list of filmmakers from the um, 70s that were prominent. So eventually, you know, as I grew up, I, wanted, I have, was interested in film, of course, but I was mostly interested in writing. And eventually my father sort of uh, directed me or tracked me into writing for film. You know, he said, you, you know, you can do that literature stuff later on. You'll have the, the freedom to do that but you can make money with writing scripts, you know, it's easier. And so I listened to him, even though I was very rebellious and didn't want to hear any of it. And I ended up studying with him and with Milos Forman at Columbia University. And then after graduating, I started to do workshops with my father in Europe. And this was at a time when really the idea of script development was basically non-existent. You know, scripts were written first drafts and then they were immediately shot and the whole idea that you know you have to think about it or work on it for some length of time was was completely foreign at that time i don't know if any of you remember that time but um, so then the you know it was about the time that the european institutions were really forming so they formed this thing called the european script fund and then you know they were developing, trying to develop basically the bring back the craft of script writing to Europe and the whole idea of what it is to, to make a good script, what it is to, what's involved in that, right? So that was the effort we were engaged in for many years. And out of that came, for example, um, uh, EAVE, you know, the, the which is another organization I still work with. It's a producer's course where. The, the three script editors of which I'm one teach basically producers how to work with writers, how to develop scripts, what's involved in that. So I'm going to just try to present to you, you know, the, the basics of those ideas, you know, the basics of um, an, an approach, and I, I'll be very clear about that. It's one approach, right, to how to do this. And I think, you know, you can, uh, take from it what is useful and discard what is not and 
think about how it applies to, to your work. Um, so what I do now is I, I work with EAVE. I teach at the University of Southern California. Um, I write scripts. I, um, and one of the main things I do is script development consulting. So you know, if you send me your script, I'll write notes and then we'll meet about it or have a Skype conversation about it. And I will tell you, you know, maybe what I think some of the problems are, but also most importantly, I'll try to find a way out of those problems, right? And find a solution. Because mm -hmm. I think the most important thing, you know, when you're talking to writers, and I think those of you who are producers will have a, a session on that, the <coughs> most important thing is to not discourage the writers, right? I think a lot of the time you get notes from people, right? How many of you are writers in the room? Okay, and how many of you have gotten notes from somebody about your script? Okay, so not, not so many, you're lucky. <laughs> the rest of you are lucky. Um, so a lot of the time, the kind of notes I see are, you know, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this scene doesn't work, that doesn't work, and you get this kind of, I call it the catalog of negativity, right? And then you go, okay, now what to do with that, right? Because first of all, if uh, those of you who are writers will probably recognize this reaction, you say, okay, that, that obviously didn't work, so I'm probably not a very good writer and maybe I should like think about doing something else and you know, this is probably not for me, right? That is definitely not the reaction you want from your writer when you give them notes, right? So what I try to do is actually figure out what's the core problem of the script because all of those other things are really just symptoms, you know, they're just, it doesn't really help you to identify the symptoms, you wanna to get to the, the core of it and what is actually behind it, what's causing these scenes to not work, right? What's causing the, the lack of understanding or the boredom or the um, confusion on the part of the reader, right? So that's really what, what you're looking to solve. You're trying to make the script better and then if you can find what's at the, root of it or what the core problems are, obviously the solution will come much easier and all of those symptoms will fall away. Those scenes will be discarded and you will find better ones because now you understand what the core of your script is, right? So I'm gonna try to identify you know, for you how I go about discerning what that is, right? What it is that is at the core problem. And to do that, I, I'll introduce you to some questions that I use, okay? So I, when, I, um, when I talk about theory here, it's a kind of a theoretical approach, right? But there's one thing that's at the core of it that's the most important thing. I'm not talking in any kind of abstract terms like you know some of you who study film theory might be used to. I'm talking in very practical, pragmatic terms. And what I'm talking about is the experience of the audience. Okay, so everything <coughs> theoretical that I'm gonna present to you has to do with what is it that the audience is experiencing. You know, it's basically the same thing that Aristotle tried to do when he wrote the Poetics because he was interested in drama, right? And he said, why does this work and that not work, right? So he tried to identify some things that work and that don't work and try to define some of those ways, which is the, the basis for you know, the beginning of dramaturgy, right, and uh, dramatic theory. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the experience of the people sitting in the theater seats and having some kind of experience, and then what it is you want them to experience, right? So, you know, is that the same? Is that connection being made? Are they experiencing the thing that you want them to experience? Because very often, you know, what I find is writers have a lot of things in their head and they put some of it on paper and they think it's there, but it's not really there yet, you know? So they need to figure out like how to get all of that there so that the audience is really reacting in the way that you want them to react, right? Rather than in some other way, which is usually, you know, confusion, boredom, disinterest, uh, whatever you know, negative thing you can think about, right? So those are the things we're trying to avoid. 
So I, I notice these theater seats kind of go up, and you hear that sound? That's, that's a sound you don't ever want to hear when your film is being screened, okay? <laughs> <coughs> So if you hear that sound in the first 15 minutes, right, and then it starts to duplicate itself and many theater seats are doing that, obviously something is wrong, right? And I don't know if any of you have had that experience of being at a festival, for example, and hearing that somebody else has hopefully filmed that happening as people are walking out thinking, oh, I can still catch that other film that's starting in Ten minutes, right? So how do we avoid that, right? That's the whole question. How do we keep the audience pinned to their seats and make them stay for the whole thing is really uh, what what is the most important thing, right? So by showing you David Lynch, I'm actually, you know, I'm really cutting to the chase. It's a very advanced example, you know, when we teach script analysis or film analysis at the university, it's probably like the last one we use after 15 weeks of seeing, you know, a lot of different films that are much simpler and much easier to understand. So I hope you are aware of that in case there's something uh, that you find confusing, right? But I think on the other hand, it's a good example because you will also get the sense that in this film where you would absolutely not expect it, there are certain things being worked with that suddenly you'll recognize from maybe some of the theoretical books you have read. And when you watch the film, it wouldn't even occur to you that something like that is at work, right? So uh, the, the whole idea behind this approach is that it's kind of open to all kinds of filmmaking, right? It's not a Hollywood approach. I just did an interview with a newspaper here and they were asking me, you know, this uh, Hollywood approach, right? It, it's not that because my father was not from Hollywood. He was obviously from Prague, but in Prague he had watched all kinds of films from all over the world, right? and he tried to figure out what is it that makes them work, right? That was his sort of his idea. And so when I was learning it, we would watch, you know, a Fellini film, an Antonioni film, we would watch a, a, a Godard film, you know, we would watch the whole range of things. And then also obviously the genre films and get the whole sense of how those genre films work, how does Hitchcock work, how does Billy Wilder work, right? But it was always from that point of view of how is the story put together? You know, what are some of the tools they're using? And that's really what I want to introduce, you know, to the extent that you don't know it already, some of those tools and how suddenly David Lynch is using them in a very different way, right? So that's the, the reason for the choice of this film. Okay, so, you know, the, the contrast between that approach and other approaches, which if you've read the books on screenwriting, a lot of them have to do with sort of, you know, this has to happen on page so and so, and this has to happen, and they lay out a bunch of, let's say, rules, right? And so um, those of you who have seen the film adaptation, you know, the, the Robert McKee character says, there are no rules, there are only principles, right? That's a line that Robert McKee stole from my father because <laughs> he used to say it a long time before. And my father used to say there's only one rule and that is you can't bore your audience for too long. <laughs> okay, that was the only rule he respected and I think that's a really good one, you know? If, you, if that's not happening, if people are interested, if people are, you know, thinking about and feeling things in your film and they're not bored, then, you know, that's, that's a huge success, right? I think that's the, the main thing that we should all strive for because we promised them some kind of experience when they paid their money and came and sat down, right? So, but so those, those kinds of approaches really have to do with what I call a, a platonic approach. In other words, if you remember Plato's example, you know, of uh, shapes that are in the ether and then they're in, uh, 
incarnation on earth. He talks about like the chair, right? So there's an idea of a perfect chair somewhere, and then when we make a chair in the world, we're just embodying that idea in, in our universe, right? In the physical universe. And that, that approach, I think, is the one that the, a lot of the script books use. You know, there's a perfect script. It looks like this. And then we just have to figure out how to put it on top of your script, right? On top of your idea. And I don't think that's a very good way of doing things because it's, you know, it's taking a theoretical construct and imposing it on something that's living and, you know, uh, organic and has its own life, right? So it's kind of like, you know, if you know the Procrustean bed where you chop off the legs and the head and everybody has to be the same length, right? That's the, the thing you end up with. So my father was a big fan of Socrates. He wrote a play about Socrates and he was a great admirer of Socrates. And if you remember, Socrates' approach was very different, which is that he believed that inside every person are the answers to all of the questions and the teacher's role is just to ask the right questions and bring that out, right? to bring that knowledge out. And I think that's really the, the approach that I was taught and that I think is the best one to use when uh, developing a story, because inside each story, I think, are all the answers. You know, it has its own life, it has its own needs. And when you ask the right questions about it, you will start, you know, it will start to emerge and it will start to take form. You know, it's a little bit like Michelangelo said about you know, when he looks at the block of stone, he sees the statue inside it already. So, you know, that's, when you have the raw material of the story, I think sometimes you can begin to discern, you know, what it is the story should, should look like, even though all that stuff is still around it and it's not, it just looks like a block of stone, right? So, I think that's the, that's the whole key um, to doing that. Okay, so, I like to demonstrate what it is to kind of lighten things up after that. I like to demonstrate what it is I'm talking about by telling a joke, okay? So if you'll suffer with me, I will tell you this joke. And then I will try to get one of you, so think about this, to tell me this joke in chronological order, okay? Because that's really the material of the joke, right? That's the, if you think about what you start with as a writer, you have an idea, and now you have to form it, right? So the joke goes like this. It's a Prague Jewish joke. I don't know if you have these here, but in Prague we have this whole cycle of Jewish jokes. They always have the same characters, and it's Mr. Kohn and Mr. Robicek. You know these? <laughs> yeah, you know this. okay. And if you get like, you know, Milos Forman and Ivan Passer and, you know, when he was still alive, my father together, they would spend five hours telling each other these jokes and there were always ones that they didn't know and, you know, I only know one, so. <laughs> okay, so in this joke, um, Mr. Kong is uh, sitting by his wife Sarah's deathbed. His wife Sarah is dying. And um, he's just there, you know, sort of keeping an eye on her and, and taking care of her. And when she wakes up, gives her some water or something. So he's sort of half asleep and suddenly Sarah wakes up and she says, Con, Con, I have to tell you something. He says, Sarah, please just take it easy. You don't have to tell me anything. Here, have some water, rest. It's going to be okay. He says, no, I have to tell you something before I die. <coughs> He says, Sarah, we said we weren't going to talk like that. You're, you're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Don't, don't think like that. He says, but you don't understand. I slept with your best friend, Mr. Robicek. He <laughs> says, Sarah, forget it. It's in the past. It doesn't matter. Says, but I slept with all of your friends. He <laughs> says, Sarah, why do you think I put the poison in your coffee? <laughs> okay. Oh, good, that worked, you know, I'm really glad because it's always a little uncertain how it will go, right? Um, in, in America, I always worry like, oh, is this going to be politically incorrect because I'm <laughs> telling a Jewish joke, you know? So 
You see, uh, can somebody tell me the joke in chronological order? Yeah? Well, there was a series of adultery, then he poisoned her, and he's by his her best friend. And then? There's more. There's a conversation. Yeah, what happens in the conversation? There are two confessions. Two confessions, yeah, exactly. And yeah? Similar. Okay, yeah. There was still one point missing where the husband realizes uh, yes. Yes, and puts poison and in the coffee. He puts poison on the okay. Oh, another one. Okay. Okay. No, it's not there. Okay. So you see, there's quite a lot of facts. Like you pointed out, you got most of it, but y yeah, that's the that's the story, right? But when you hear that, does that sound like a story you want to hear? Does it have any effect on you? You kind of go, oh, that's terrible, right? And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's investigation discovery. I don't know if you have this channel here, right? So it's one of those stories, but told very quickly there. They at least delay the you know, way that you find these things out, right? And make you wonder and all of that. But it's a very... Uh, sad story, but it's not a good story, right? It's not, a, not something you can just immediately make uh, as a film in, its, in that form, right? But as a basis for a film story, I think it has some potential, right? So you would have to decide what kind of film you're making, right? And then how are you going to organize the material? You know, what are you going to hold back from the audience? Because that's what the joke does, right? It withholds certain information and then it releases it at a moment that has a certain impact, right? And the impact in this case that you're looking for is laughter. And so, you know, the, the release of the information creates that release in you that gives you the laughter because you realize something, right? So that's what you do when you shape a story um, from the material that you have. You have to figure out what's the most effective way to tell this to get the effect that I want, right? And when it's not working, like let's say you hadn't laughed, which would have been terrible for me, right? I would have had to think about like, what did I, did I tell the joke wrong? You know, because there's people who screw up jokes, right? So then I'd be like, oh, what did I, did I, oh, I said that too soon, right? I should have, I, I forgot, yeah, I had to hold back that part or whatever, right? So I would have screwed it up in some way. Okay, so that's the difference between the, you know, the story to be told and the way the story is told, the story material and all of that, right? So I'm, as a script editor, you know, I'm paid to sort of find problems, right? That's an unfortunate aspect of my job. And I really believe very strongly in the idea, you know, we have a saying in America, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So I try to approach every script that I read with a very open mind. And again, this means that I'm not trying to impose these constructs, theoretical constructs on it, right? I try to go, am I enjoying this? Am I getting it? Do I understand it? You know, am I having an experience that would be good to have in the movie theater? and try to understand it as, as best as possible, and then only try to, let's say, fix, quote unquote, things when I really feel that something is getting in the way of that experience. And I would urge all of you to, to also have that approach when you're reading scripts, right? You're basically the first audience for a film that still doesn't exist when you read a script, but you know, this is the, the experience you should be having. And if you come with preconceived notions, then that's going to get in the way of that, right? If you start to, to think what things should be like and all of that. And for those of you who are writers, you know, the, the important question is, what is it that you want the audience to feel? What is it that you want them to understand? <laughs> and um, very few writers will, when you ask them that, question, they won't say like, I want to bore the crap out of people and, you know, <laughs> make them really confused and walk out and, you know, shaking their heads and wondering why they came to this, right? But sometimes that's the effect of the, you know, thing you actually have on paper right now, right? So that's why it needs to be worked on. Okay? So 
the whole thing about um, <coughs> the audience experience, and I'll just show you, uh, try to show you two kinds of films, right? There's one kind of film where you sit there and things come before you in a certain order and they are presented to you, you look at them, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're uh, great, wonderfully shot, you know, sometimes they're uh, beautiful, sometimes they're sad, All, you know, and, and then you just sit there and you passively take in this series of images and in the end I think you have some kind of experience from that, but that's basically, you know, the level that you're at for the whole film, right? That's, that's what I call the and then and then and then film. And then there's another kind of film which is um, one where your imagination and your emotions are excited to the extent that you're actually looking forward in time in the story, right? And you're imagining what could happen, right? So that's a very different experience because you're projecting forward in time. You're actually part of the storytelling process now. You're no longer a passive recipient. You're somebody who's inventing the story and then being surprised by the actual development of the story, right? So that's something where you're, you know, projected into the future. Film exists in time, right? And in projecting us into the future and emotionally you care about what that outcome is, right? You're going, oh, I hope they don't do that or I hope they don't find that out or, you know, what will happen when these two meet? That's going to really be terrible, right? And all of that stuff. So, you know, th that's a very different experience and to create that experience, to get, to make that switch from and then and then and then to the anticipation of the audience requires some effort on your part as a writer, right? And that, I think, is what um, is most interesting to me is what it is, how, how do you get there, right? And so for trying to find out what it is that makes that difference, um, there are certain questions you can ask, right? And so I'll just go through those questions now. And they seem really simple, but I'll just tell you that as a script editor, you know, when I'm looking for those core problems that I mentioned, these are the questions that I'm using as my sort of compass in the script, right? I'm going, is it this problem? Is it in this question? Or is it this problem in this question, right? Or so there's four questions and you know, within them, even though they de sound deceptively simple, you can find all of the answers to uh, most script problems, right? So the first question, and the most important one, is whose story is it, right? And so that sounds really simple. Yeah, it's Joe's story, right? But it's, that question is really all about the work that you do in creating a character, right? And in creating characters. So I find that 90% of the time, you know, and 90% of the effort that a screenwriter has to put out is in the actual creation of real living, breathing, uh, believable, understandable characters, right? Where you go, yes, that's a person. Yes, that's somebody I can see is a complete whole and has all the aspects that a human being has, right? And that's a huge amount of work. I mean, when you think about what you're doing there, that's, you know, it's all your powers of observation, all your understanding that you have of, you know, human relations, right? That's, that's the core of what we are doing, right? If you read the books uh, about screenwriting, you're mostly hearing about structure, right? And I think later in this uh, introduction, I'll give you an example of why structure is 10% and why everything else is 90%, right? You'll, you'll get an absolute demonstration of that, right? So while it's a simple question, when you don't have the clear definition of a character, when I read a script that doesn't have that, I start to explore the character with the writer. I ask questions, right? I think, you know, the important thing is if I tell you something is bad, right? you're gonna go, okay, this guy's an asshole and he's not on my side, right? If I ask you a question about your script, you're gonna go, oh, he's really interested and maybe there's something he doesn't understand that I can explain, right? So it's a very different relationship we now have 
uh, as you know, people having a conversation, right? So asking questions is, is always a good thing to do because basically you're just trying to understand, right? So that's, that's what I do. So, you know, what is this person like? Why, you know, then I might point out some flaws in the script when we get to that point. I say, well, why does he do this here and that there, right? And yesterday, uh, the gentleman who was interviewing me asked me, well, what if it's a character with contrary impulses, right? I go, great, you know, like, that's what we want, right? Is somebody who has an inner struggle and who, whose one side pulls them this way and another side this way and they do unpredictable things, but it still has to be believable and it has to make sense on some level, right? It can't just be random and it can't be perceived by the audience as something that we aren't able to understand. If we understand that this is a person with, you know, two sides to their character, that's fantastic. It's a complex character, right? So all of this has to do with that question, right? Part of that question is also a choice you're making, right? So it's a choice about how is the audience going to enter the story? Through whom and exactly what strategy are you going to use for us to enter the story, right? How, who are we going to feel emotions with? Who's going to drive the story? It doesn't always have to be the same person. And that's why I say these are strategies, right? But they are choices. They are things that we decide. And sometimes we make the wrong choice, right? When we're developing a script. And then maybe it's worthwhile to think about what if it was done a different way? What if you chose a different strategy for this, right? So these are all very important things. Like, for example, you'll sometimes have a film. So again, I keep coming back to this interview. So I how many of you have seen <laughs> Leviathan, the Russian film? Leviathan? Uh, yeah, okay, I, have I have to pronounce it. The Correct way, okay? So most of you have seen that, right? If, I, if you would say, whose story is it? What do you think, what comes to your mind? Anybody wanna? Yeah, there's no right or wrong. It's just how you felt it, you know? So don't be afraid of making a mistake in class or something. I'm not grading you. The mother? The mother? Okay, very good. I absolutely agree. I think. You know, that's an example where the, the mother is the, the central character, the one that we feel the emotions with, right? She's the one whose shoes we enter. We're in her shoes, we're feeling the, the story through her, but she's not the one driving the story, right? No. The, well, the, only well, she dies and then yeah, he, well. he goes on, right? <laughs> So actually the, the husband is the motor of the story, right? But we don't really identify with him because he's kind of a hothead and he does the wrong thing and you know he's kind of abusive and all of that, right? So he provides the motor, like he has the want, which is what we're gonna get to now. He's the one who's driving things and who's making decisions and doing things and you know, making choices, and she has to live with all of that, and it affects her until, obviously, it has a certain outcome. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to give it away. But, um, you know, that's, the, that's a strategy, right? That's what I mean by strategy. It's a fairly common strategy. But if you don't make those choices, and if you aren't aware of how it is that you're going to make us w feel on the one hand and stay interested on the other hand, you know, how is it that the story's going to be built, you haven't, you know, found what's going on in your story yet, okay? So that's the next question, which is what does the character want, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody in the story has to be going after something and encountering obstacles, and we have to understand what that want is, and we have to sort of, you know, have a feeling about what we would like to have happen with it, right? You know, do we want them to succeed or... Possibly do we want them to fail, right? We want something to happen, and part of that is our evaluation of the character's motivation and moral center and, you know, what it is they're actually doing and all of that, right? So that's the, that's the motor of the story, and maybe, you know, in some cases that's not the person whose shoes we want to be in. We want to experience it with somebody else. Obviously, then there's other kinds of stories which are multiple storylines, right? Or 
other narrative strategies where you're gonna be taking these questions and using them in a different way because you're gonna be interweaving them and you're actually gonna be doing this work like four or five times if you have four or five storylines, right, for example. So what does the character want? And I wanna be really clear what I mean by that. The want is something that is clear to the audience, it's understandable, it's achievable, right? It's achievable within the scope that the film is covering. Um, it's time bound, right? In other words, it has to take place within a certain amount of time, right? And it's very specific. It's like a very clear thing, you know, save your house from the, the party secretary or whoever the guy is. That's, that's a very clear goal, right? That we can all relate to and we go, yeah, I would fight for that too if this was happening to me. So, you know, that's a, a very clear thing. It should not be something abstract, right? It shouldn't be like the character wants love, for example, because that's like a general abstract thing. In all, in all these things that we are doing, I think we're always lo looking for the specifics, right? And the more specific we get, the more characters come to life, right? Because we understand about them. The more you move from the general to the specific, the more things come to life, right, for the audience. So um, the goal has to be very specific. If you say something like he wants love, we go, okay, yeah, we all do, right? Yeah. And that's great, I can empathize with that, but I'm not in yet, you know, I'm not like following the story. When the character fixates on somebody, like th I'm gonna find love with this person, and we go, oh, really? <laughs> Good luck with that, right? <laughs> then we're like, now we're in, because we go, oh, you can't be serious. You're really gonna, <laughs> you're gonna go for that, right? And it's like with your friends, right? When they meet somebody and you go, oh no, I gotta <laughs> tell them, right? But I can't, because, you know, I don't want to ruin it, but it's obvious what's happening, and then you like try to find the courage to tell them, right? So then you're you're engaged emotionally in the outcome, you know, when they're just going, oh, I want to find somebody, you might kind of help them, but you're not like, it's not like the same kind of locked in that you get when it becomes specific, right? Okay, so then, you know, the the next question to which all of this leads, and this is really what I mean by tension, so, you know, I'm gonna talk a lot about tension. So tension is um, a feeling about the outcome of things, right? Where we care about the outcome. What are the emotions that we look into the future with? Does anybody wanna take a crack at that? When you approach a new situation, what are the, the two feelings that you might be feeling as you're approaching the situation? What did you feel when you walked into this room? Or when you were standing out there? I can tell you what I felt. Go ahead. Excitement. Excitement, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something more, right? Something more profound, I think. Uh, hope. hope, yeah, hope. I think we all feel hope, like you, you hope. You're excited because you hope you're gonna find out something new. You've heard about this guy and maybe he's got some interesting things to say, right? So you hope you're gonna find something that's gonna be useful to you in your work, right? And what's the opposite of that? Fear. fear. Who said that? Okay. So fear, yeah. So, you know, you are also afraid that maybe this guy's gonna talk a bunch of Hollywood crap. It's gonna <laughs> be that same stuff you read in Sid Field, right? And it's just more <laughs> of that stuff that has no application to my work at all, right? <laughs> You know, so you, you, you that approach all situations with that. And I, of course, have my own complex of emotions that I approach, you know, talking in front of 150 people uh, who are sitting on hard chairs, you know. So um, we all feel that. And so how do you get the audience to feel that, right? So that's the next question, which is what are we hoping for and what are we afraid of, right? And so that's what, you know, at some point in the story, there has to be kind of a main <coughs> through line, which we call the main tension, right? Which is, that's, this is the thing we're gonna follow in the story. You know, is the man gonna save his house or not, right? That's what 
the main tension of Leviathan is. So, you know, then we get engaged in that. And of course, the story ends up, in this case, taking us to a very different place, just like Mulholland Drive does. It's not a conventional story by any means, obviously. And, but, you know, it has that hook that brings us in, that makes us care about the characters, that immerses us into their lives, that makes us follow their struggle, right? And at a certain point, it kind of launches us into a much farther place than we ever anticipated that question would take us, right? So it's, it's kind of like a shooting a rocket into space, you know, and the, the stages fall away, right? So those are the, the conventional aspects of the story. And then we were out there, you know, in some really heavy stuff that, that I think is very interesting. Same with David Lynch, you know? So what he does is he starts with a, a, let's say, conventional or classical approach and then starts to do things with it once he's got us, once he's got us hooked, you know, by the, by the, then, w then we're ready to go with him wherever he wants to take us and he knows that, so he's using that as a way. So, you know, that's the, the thing and if you look at lots of films that are very interesting in their, um, construction and deconstruction and playing with structure, a lot of them will do that, you know. They will take some of the elements of, of conventional classical approaches and use them, but then take us in a place that's much more interesting, right? So I think that's just one, one way of doing it. Um, it's interesting that when David Lynch was studying with my father, the film that they uh, looked at together very intensively because it was a new film at the time, was The Conformist. Do you guys know that film? Bertolucci, Il Conformista. How many of you have seen it? Okay, so those of you that haven't, that's your homework assignment because there are some references to that film in here and it's, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest films ever made. So, you know, it's one that hopefully the only reason I would tell you to delay it would be to, if you ever have a chance to see it in a really good print on the big screen because it really merits that. But so they looked at that film and at that time, that film was a you know daring, completely different way of storytelling. It was a very daring strategy for you know how a story is told. And, and a lot of people very, were very confused by it, right? They'd watch and they'd go, what the heck is going on, right? And then, you know, they go see it two or three times and they go, oh, I see, that's what's going on and figure it out, right? Did any of you have that feeling watching Mulholland Drive the first time or, yeah? Anybody go, what the heck is going on? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so hopefully by the end of today, you'll be like, oh, I see, that. I get it. So that's my job for today, but also to show you how it works, right? Okay, then the last question is, what does the character need, okay? And that's the one that's usually left for the end, you know, it's something that, first of all, the audience doesn't know at the beginning of the film, the character doesn't know it, and it's something that, as the audience, we slowly discover. We come into a consciousness that is higher than the character has, and we go, ah, this character really needs to do this or change their approach in this way in order to get what they want or avoid what they're trying to avoid. And so, you know, that's something that slowly emerges, and then the resolution of the film really has to do with the question, is the character going to realize this? Is the character going to make the required change, right? Or is he going to, or she going to um, somehow fail because, or self-destruct or whatever because of this lack of understanding on their part? So that's something that's <coughs> very, you know, that's the one that's abstract, right? When you go, the character needs love. That's closer to the, the need question, right? Because that's non-specific and a little bit more general and has to do with philosophical questions and all of that. But in that gap between what the character wants and what the character needs and in the outcome of the relationship of those at the end of the film 
is really where the thematic material is contained, right? What it is you're trying to say or what it is that we come to understand with the story, right? And I like to be very careful with that idea of theme, right, personally, um, especially when I'm working with writers. I have other colleagues who like to put writers on the spot and say, what's your film really about, you know? And I go, I can see what you're exploring and I can see where we're going. And I, I try not to put somebody on the spot until a much later, let's say, stage of the script where if it's not becoming apparent, then I'll start to ask that kind of question, right? Because again, the, the reaction can be, oh shit, I don't know, right? And I can't express it, therefore I have somehow failed as an artist to you know, convey some idea that is supposed to be at the core of what it is I'm doing. And my whole thing is I want you to just keep writing and coming with more stuff and developing things and then we'll find that, right? We'll figure it out because you'll have something there. You don't just write without any ideas, right? So that, that's the... The difference. So that's why I call it, you know, I like to think of it more like exploration. The theme is more like an exploration of an aspect of human experience. At some point you, you have your take on it, right? And we sort of think about that when we go home and we go, yeah, you know, it is kind of like that or whatever. But I don't like the, the message kind of films and I really dissuade people from the so-called the drum a la thèse, you know, the thesis drama where you have a point you want to make and you make your characters move around like cardboard cutouts to demonstrate your point, right? I don't think that ever works. So I think, you know, what it is we do is when we create these characters and they're alive and breathing and they start to do things as we're writing, I think the most wonderful stuff that comes up is when they surprise us and when suddenly we get an idea and the character does something, we go, oh, that's terrific, right? And now I really understand this guy and now I can go. And, you know, the, the thing that is the danger then is you're getting lost in your story because you're like, you know, going through the whole thing. So I'll talk a little bit about the process and how you can avoid that happening, right? Okay, so... You know, we're, we're kind of in a godlike position vis-a-vis -vis the characters, and part of that is also given with uh, a kind of tool that, that you'll recognize immediately, I think, which is revelation and recognition, right? So that's revelation is when the audience knows something that the character doesn't know, right? And then the recognition is the moment when the character realizes that thing, right? So you all know, you know, Oedipus Rex, right? That was uh, the film, Arist uh, film. <laughs> this uh, play Aristotle used to demonstrate that, right? Which is that, you know, Oedip we know that Oedipus is sleep killing his father and sleeping with his mother and he doesn't know and then we're waiting for him to find out and what will he do when he finds out, right? So that's, that's revelation and recognition used to define the main tension, right? But you can also use it in scenes and, you know, we can see something that the character doesn't see. It's a very good tool for the creation of um, uh, suspense and of tension in general, right? And then, you know, after that, you know, the, the question is, you know, who knows what and when do they know it? Which is now what we're asking ourselves once again in America about our political leaders. So who, who knew what and when did they know it, right? Becomes a very important question, but it's also important in uh, making a story, right? Because when does one character know something and another one doesn't? And that was in the joke I told you, obviously, the, the thing that made the joke work, right? Okay, so then I'm going to introduce you to a concept that takes that one step further, right? Because we've talked about the main tension, and now we got to figure out a way to sustain that, right? So <coughs> we know what we're hoping for and what we're afraid of, and then now there are some steps in the development of that, which you know we call sequences, and I'm sure you've probably heard this already. But you know, how is it that you build the story and keep that tension growing and going um, in those chapters of the story? How do you define those? Do you have enough of them? 
Um, are they exciting enough? Are you not stretching one too far, for example, right? So those become really important questions on, you know, related to the main tension that have to do with the work more in detail. And then obviously the tension question gets into scenes also because, you know, important scenes, dramatic scenes also have whose scene is it and what does the character want and what are we hoping for, what are we afraid of. So, you know, that level also the work continues on and there's certain kinds of scenes that have to work in your film, right? I can usually identify in a script like five or six scenes that <coughs> you absolutely have to work on. You know, obviously you should work on all of them, but there's certain ones that are sort of make or break scenes that, you know, you can focus on and make better and that'll make a huge improvement in your script, right? So that, that's what I look at. So now I'm gonna, kind of jump to that thing that I talked about, you know, demonstrating for you the relative importance of, um, uh, you know, structure and then all the other stuff, right? I'll just put that in a big basket. So we have an exercise we kind of make our um, beginning writers do where we say, look, we're going to give you a kind of story template, right? It's a story that you've seen a lot of times and you need to fill it with your characters, your situations, but basically we're gonna tell you what the main tension is, right? Because that's usually hard for people is, you know, to find one and to figure one out, okay? And the story is a, a kind of road movie, right? It's called A Trip With Destination, and it goes like this. This is the structure of the, the film, right? Somebody is living their life, their ordinary routine, right? Then some reason comes up for them to go on a trip. And at the end of act one, right, we realize that they, they decide to go on the trip and we know where they're going and what it is they're gonna do there, right? That's the mission, I call it. And we also know that this is not gonna be an easy thing for them, you know, either the trip or the mission or both, right? So. Now we're on the journey with the character, right? In the second act, we follow the journey and they have obstacles that arise, they have relationships that develop, things happen between people on this journey, right? Either people they meet or people they have with them. And eventually, you know, it becomes a question, will they make it, right? And then they make it, right? And now the new tension for the third act is, will they do the thing that they set out to do Will they do it differently? You know, do they now have a changed approach to what it is that they set out to do initially, right? So have any of you seen a film like that? Thousands. Thousands, yeah. <laughs> and when you say that, does it mean you don't wanna see another one? No. <laughs> okay. That, see, this is the, the tricky thing, right? So you go, well, I've seen that. But then you look at, can we get some examples? Anybody want to throw some names of films out? Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers, yeah. That usually doesn't come up. <laughs> Surprised, because what? Broken Flowers by Twilight. Okay, I, I don't know that one, but yeah, I believe you. Nebraska. Nebraska. Nebraska, yeah, that's a really recent one, right? Yeah. Don't mind Louise, yeah, although that's a little bit of a twist because it doesn't have a destination and a mission, right? So it's, a, it's more like a women on the run story. So there's other kinds of road movies, right? There's quests, Easy Rider, for example, you know, you would think more of as a quest rather than a, like we're not hoping they make it to New Orleans, right? So it's important to understand what make what is actually making the tension of your film, right? Even if it's a different kind of road movie that again has a different tension than getting from point A to point B and doing something that's, okay? And then I'll just throw out some more. So there's like uh, the African Queen, you know, you know the old uh, Humphrey Bogart film, Little Miss Sunshine, um, Central Station, Central do Brazil, you know that Stand film? By. Stand by me, yeah, I guess, yes. I guess Stand by me would fall into that. So you see all the different films, right? And they all have the same structure, but that's not why we watch them. That's, it kind of keeps us going in the film, right? But what we are really interested in is the people 
and the fact that you've made them come to life for us, that they're absolutely unique, that their relationship is absolutely you know, different from what we've seen because they're real people. Each person, you know, to state the obvious, is, is absolutely unique, right? We may have certain features that we share with others and a lot of what makes us human we share, but each one of us does that in their own way, right? So my father used to say the greatest cliche of all is human life, right? <laughs> And uh, he would go through the, all the stages, you know, you're born and then you go to school or you don't go to school and you have relationship or you don't, you find love, you don't have kids, you don't have kids, you know, all those uh, binary options that human life presents and then it always ends the same way, right? So it's a terrible, <laughs> terrible cliche. So, you know, but within that is contained all the, all the richness of, human experience, right? And that's really the thing that, you know, is important to understand is it's that richness and those struggles and all of that that you're presenting and the way you find to string that all together while it has to be there is really not the important thing. I mean, it has to be there. If it's not there, then all the work you've done in creating characters is might go to waste, right? Because the audience doesn't know why they're watching this and you've made fantastic characters but you know we don't really get to understand them because <laughs> we don't really get to recognize their struggle right okay so then there's one last uh, thing maybe I want to talk about which is um, the uh, concept I stole um, <laughs> from Moens Rukov. Do you guys know Moens Rukov was the guy, uh, he teaches at the Danish Film School and he uh, co-wrote Festen, for example. Uh, um, celebration it's called in English. Have any of you seen Festen? Yeah. 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 Okay. So he talks about the concept of the natural story, right? Which actually the road movie is also a natural story because we've all had that experience, right? We've all gone on a trip that makes us go somewhere where we have to do something, right? Sometimes something we don't want to have to do. And, you know, that's a very automatically becomes an interesting story because journeys are interesting. You know, doing things you don't want to do is interesting. The people you're going to encounter there or along the way are interesting, right? So that, that's a natural story, right? And so is Festen because it's the story of a, um, family gathering, right, a family reunion. And so that has, you know, if you've been to one of those, you recognize the features, right? Everybody arrives, then they welcome each other, they have a drink or something, then they eat a meal together, then they dance or they do some fun stuff, they play games, you know, whatever. And then they, you know, however long it takes, eventually they say goodbye and they all go off to their different lives, right? And that's a very common human experience and you could use that to tell whatever story you want to tell, right? So the great thing about natural stories is you already know where to begin and where to end, which is one of the hardest choices very often to make, right? And you already know some of the sequences, right? Because the getting together is a sequence, you know, the, the first welcome is a sequence, the dinner in Festen, it's courses, right? So each course is a sequence, right? Because there's so much going on at that dinner. And then, you know, the, the goodbye, the resolution at the end and all of that. So already you see, you know, the, the main tension within that is obviously the struggle of the uh, son and his father, right? And the, the revelation that he brings out and how that will be received but it's put in the context of a very normal human experience. So this very twisted situation is put in the form of a normal human experience. Okay, so you're already, I think, beginning to see what I mean by sequences and all of that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the process of development, right, as for writers um, and for producers. So, I think it's always, you know, as I've been going through this, you know, at some point it's once you identify your main tension, right? I think it's good to write the story in a simple <laughs> form, right? To, to kind of go, 
however you arrive at, you know, every writer's process is different, and that's something that you shouldn't really, I've learned not to mess with, right? It's like, you just, you do what you want, but at some point we've got to figure out, like, you know, what's the main tension of your story now that you have the characters, you have some situations, you have some possible things that could be the tension, right? Um, which one are you going to pick? You know, whose story is it going to be? And then I usually ask the writer to, to write the story in a simple way, right? I think the most important thing that a writer can do is not get lost in their material. And I find that to be the biggest um, problem that writers have, you know, once they start writing 120 page scripts, right? Is they get, they get immersed in this stuff they start writing scenes and they love the scenes and then they, you know, get write the next scene and all of a sudden you've got 120 pages of stuff and the writer does not really remember everything that's in there, right? And that's fine, but then there comes the next step, which is, okay, now you've got that, now let's look at it, let's organize it, let's analyze it, right? And it's very important that those two processes be kept separate, <coughs> right? Because Otherwise, you're going to be sort of the critic on your shoulder, or you're going to stop your creative process from continuing. So you don't want to be analyzing too much while you're writing it, but when you get a draft done, then you go, okay, does it work? Is it what I want, right? Does everything um, work the way that it should? And that's the analytical process, right? So the, the, tell another joke, right? It's time, time for another joke, right? Um, so my father used this joke to demonstrate, and this is, you know, since I'm telling you this theoretical stuff, you need to hear this. Um, so there was a man who um, helped an alchemist. You know, now we're in Central Europe, everybody knows what an alchemist is. Um, he helped the alchemist with something, and the alchemist says, okay, I'm gonna give you the secret to make gold from rocks, right? Great, you know, I can use that. So gave him the whole formula, and the man said, well, that's really simple, you know, I, I can do that. And that's what you're getting here, right? I'm telling you how to make gold from rocks. And then the, he, the, on the way out the door, the alchemist said, oh, but just one thing, don't ever think about squirrels when you're doing this, you know? <laughs> so of course the man never made gold from rocks because he was always thinking about squirrels, right? So this is, I want you to try not to think about squirrels or these analytical things when you're writing your script. You have to think about your characters and your situations and let them come to life and let them act and only bring that in at the right stage, which is when you've completed something and when you're trying to figure out whether it works or not, right? So it's a, it's a switch you have to make in your head, I guess I would put it that way. And I have the hardest time with that since my job is uh, so much analytical, right? So for me, that's a, that's a struggle to not do that. But the, the thing is, you don't want to have anything get in the way of your um, process, right? But then when you go to the next stage, because I think the first draft should be sort of free-flowing, you're just discovering things, you're finding your story, you're finding your characters, right? When you get to that next stage, I don't think it's a good idea to just go, you know, once you've found the problems, to just go and write another draft, right? What I like to do is to write a step outline, right, which is what happens in each scene, and then use that as the blueprint for the next draft. I sometimes use it for the first draft, just because I'm lazy and believe in the tenet, don't work hard, work smart, you know. <laughs> but that's just my process, right? I'm not saying you have to use that. And I don't recommend that you be lazy either. <laughs> okay, so um, once you have that, the thing is, you shouldn't be handcuffed to it, right? It shouldn't be something where now you're just doing a paint by numbers uh, uh, step for your next draft, right? What you actually have is a tool that when you start writing the story and you start getting those ideas, you can go 
you know, cross this out and put something else instead, but you have an overview, you have a simple overview of your story that allows you to then go, oh, you know, I could use this, like planting and payoff, you all know what that is. You know, something happens here and then comes back here, right? In order to find those things, it's good to have that overview because you go, oh, I can use that in that scene. You know, he's gonna say that again, or he's gonna pull out the prop that's the, the one that, you know, we forgot about, right? And that's when it's gonna happen. And so you can make those notes and you can also allow the thing to evolve on its own without getting lost in it, right? So that's a really useful tool, I find. I find it a useful tool uh, for producers um, because if you just send people off to write draft after draft after draft, they get lost in the material and they feel burned out, right? Have any of you had that experience as writers where you just like have to do many drafts and then you just kind of feel like I don't have any more energy for this project. Anybody? Yeah, you've got that. Okay. <laughs> Everybody else is too young there. Just <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> okay. So, so those are things. Those are ways to um, avoid those problems. You know, when I do an analysis of a script, I do that for myself. I actually write down like what happens in each scene, especially if it's a complex story, or at least I have a sense of the main turning points and the main things that happen, right? Because I also have to find that overview of it. And once I do that, then I go, oh, I see, this is where there's like a lack of development. This is something that needs, needs more work, right? Okay, so. I think that's it for the introductory lecture and then we'll just go into the film. So we'll take a break and then we'll start the film and maybe uh, take a little break in the middle because it's a long sure. film. Whose story is it? Uh, Naomi Watts. Yeah. Naomi Watts, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's her story, right? <laughs> 